The Boston Tea Party is an event that's often discussed, but generally little understood, I think. For my part, I always used to wonder why it, you know, mere property damage, was the event that resulted in the massive escalation by the British government in the form of the coercive, also called the intolerable acts. Now, the Tea Party was in no way an isolated incident. Uh, leading up to that fateful night in 1773 was a long history of not just property destruction, but active civil violence uh, against the military, against uh, civil servants, and even against common civilians. Uh, indeed, in previous content, Josh from Adventures in History Land and I discussed that history of uh, violence and brawls in the streets and the like, and how that violence eventually culminated in the Boston Massacre and indeed the night of violence which surrounded the Boston Massacre. It wasn't just, you know, the actual shooting, it was a whole ordeal surrounding that affair. Uh, link, of course, is in the description for those two videos that I did with him uh, if you would like to learn more on that particular subject, of course. It's a long form, but still a very good discussion, I think. But the point is, uh, if customs officials being dragged from their homes in the night to be beaten and tortured, if mobs of townsmen and soldiers alike like wielding cudgels and cutlasses were attacking each other in the streets, and if eventually those rising tensions resulted in a riot which saw multiple companies of British regular soldiers standing to, blocking off roadways around the state house, and ready to engage in street firings uh, should that mob, which incidentally had been actively attacking British officers and soldiers in the streets on sight, Lest that mob should, should, should surge and rush against the army, they need to defend themselves. If all of these extreme examples of civil disruptions were taking place well before the Boston Tea Party, if the city was very nearly on the brink of revolution already, well then why on earth was just a, a simple bit of property damage, some, some leaves being thrown into a harbor, why is that such a big deal? Well, as you may expect, the Boston Tea Party was so much bigger than just a couple of crates of tea being thrown overboard into a harbor. Not only, of course, in its material terms, the value of the tea and whatnot, but infinitely more significant, I think, in the ideological terms. First of all, some background information. It all starts with the Tea Act of 1773, which was not, as you might expect, a tax on tea. There are many other taxes, but this was not one of them. Indeed, for those consumers of legally imported British tea, as opposed to the you know, smuggled in Dutch and other forms of tea, it actually made the stuff a lot cheaper. You see, prior to this point, the East India Company, which had a large monopoly on the tea trade for the British Empire, was struggling financially, and they were sitting on an awful lot of inventory which they needed desperately to offload, um, which the Tea Act was designed to help them do. Now, under normal circumstances, broadly speaking at least, uh, tea would be imported to Britain, sold at auction to various consignees there, before being uh, brought to uh, the colonies by those, you know, middlemen for resale. Now, the Tea Act made it actually legal instead uh, for the East India Company to move their product directly to the North American market. By removing the middlemen, those London-based tea consignees and whatnot, and simplifying the logistics of the whole affair, the Tea Act actually lowered the price of tea rather dramatically. Even further, it removed the export duty on tea that did happen to come from Britain itself. So now, not only was the legally imported tea of a higher quality than the smuggled tea, which uh, had already become so immensely popular in British North America, but this makes the legal tea cheaper than the smuggled stuff as well. Now, by pretty much every metric that I can imagine, from a purely economic point of view, the Tea Act was not an act of economic oppression, rather it was immensely good for the average consumer. But, of course, there were deeper ideological concerns at play here, and Yankee smugglers, who were at risk now of losing their markets, were particularly keen to promote this ideology among an already boiling, because of all the other concerns, population. The British tea may be better, and the British tea may be cheaper, but all the same, when you buy a legal product, you are still paying, or at least someone along the line is, paying a tax on it. 
even if that tax is a very, very small tax, as it was indeed. I think it was like a couple of pence for every pound. Or it was a very small tax. Um, but still, you are, when you pay that tax, you are acknowledging that tax. When you buy a smuggled product, even if it winds up being more expensive, there is still no tax on that smuggled good, even if you're paying more for it. When you buy a British import, you pay a British tax. What you're doing as such, according to men like Samuel Adams, is acknowledging the legitimacy of that tax. It's not specifically about the tea or even the tea act itself. Rather, it's about the taxation which predates all of it. This same principle could, in theory, have happened with all sorts of different products. It just so happens that tea was a very high volume trade, which affected the population at near every level. It was a very high uh, profile product, if you will. It was a high profile economic policy on a high profile product, which was at the heart of a much deeper rooted ideological struggle between the colonies and the mother country. And to be sure, the economic interests of Boston's business leaders, particularly again the uh, mercantile classes and the smugglers, uh, certainly did not help to cool uh, the relations either. The result of all of this is a clamoring in the city that to modern eyes, without the full context, might seem silly and out of place. People are getting ready to riot. They're accusing each other of high treason and even visiting violence on their fellow citizens over some hot leaf water. Now, I'd like to hand the reins over to the aforementioned Adventures in History Land for a short time because he has some fascinating accounts which I think really help to display exactly what I mean by all this, exactly how up in arms the population was getting over tea of all things. This wasn't just a, uh, a simple, you know, economic disagreement. This was a deep-rooted ideological struggle. Josh, over to you, my friend. Thank you, Brandon. The matter of East India Company tea in Boston in late 1773 was indeed no trivial affair. It struck at the heart of a wider economic and political debate regarding the rights of British Americans and came to delineate sides in an increasingly partisan dispute. As the following accounts will demonstrate, the politics of tea could get you in some very hot water. Boo! In mid-November of 1773, a circular from a committee of citizens to those of Boston's surrounding towns asked for their support in opposing the landing of the East India Company tea consignment. Written by none other than Samuel Adams, it ended with an appeal to law and justice. If we are prevailed upon implicitly to acknowledge a right to taxes by receiving and consuming teas loaded with a tax imposed by the British Parliament, we may be assured that in a very short time, taxes of the like, or a more grievous nature, will be laid on every article exported from Great Britain, which our necessity may require, or our shameful luxury may betray us into the use of. And when once they have found a way to rob us, their avarice will never be satisfied, until our own manufactures, and even our land, purchased and cultivated by our hard-working ancestors, are taxed to support the vices and extravagances of wretches whose vileness ought to banish them from the society of men. We think, therefore, gentlemen, that we are in duty bound to use our most strenuous endeavours to ward off the impending evil, and we are sure that upon a fair and cool inquiry into the nature and tendency of this ministerial plan, you will think this tea now coming to us more to be dreaded than plague and pestilence. For these can only destroy our mortal bodies, but we never knew a country enslaved without the destruction of their virtue, the loss of which every good man must esteem infinitely greater than the loss of life, and we earnestly request that after having carefully considered this important matter, you will impress upon the minds of your friends, neighbours, and fellow townsmen the necessity of exerting themselves in a most zealous and determined manner to save the present and future generations from temporal, and we think we may with seriousness say, eternal, 
destruction. In his letter, commonly entitled On Patriotism, printed in Philadelphia on the 20th of October, 1773, Dr. Benjamin Rush made a case that love of country was equal to love of justice and went on a long preamble where he cited both biblical and classical precedent to support this. He then went on to make his point. The design of this attempt to rescue patriotism from obloquy is to prepare the way for calling upon you to show whether the opposition you formerly gave to the British Parliament in their attempts to tax the American colonies was founded resentment and party rage, or whether it flowed from well-informed zeal in the cause of liberty. You have heard of the machinations of the enemies of our country to enslave us by means of the East India Company. By the last accounts from Britain, we are informed that vessels were freighted to bring over a quantity of tea taxed with a duty to raise a revenue from America. Should it be landed, it is to be feared that it will find its way amongst us. Then farewell, American liberty. We will be undone forever. All images we can borrow from everything terrible in nature are too faint to describe the horror of our situation. But I rely too much upon that virtue, which has distinguished my fellow countrymen to cherish a thought that this will be the case. Let us with one heart and hand oppose the landing of it. The baneful chests contain in them a slow poison. In a political as well as a physical sense, they contain something worse than death. The seeds of slavery. Remember, my countrymen, the present era Perhaps the present struggle will fix the constitution of America forever. Think of your ancestors and your posterity. The appeals of men like Adams and Rush to friends, neighbours and fellow townsmen did not take long to spread. And an idea of the character that this could take can be gleaned by reading the notice that was pinned up in 1774 by a shadowy cove using the pseudonym Joyce Jr. Brethren and fellow citizens, you may depend that those odious miscreants and detestable tools to ministry and governor, the tea consignees, those traitors to their country, butchers who have done and are doing everything to murder and destroy all that shall stand in the way of their private interest, are determined to come and reside again in the town of Boston. I therefore give you this early notice that you may hold yourselves in readiness, on the shortest notice, to give them such a reception as such vile ingrates deserve. Joyce Jr., Chairman of the Committee of Tarring and Feathering. Postscript. If any person should be so hardy as to tear this down, they may expect my severest resentment, signed the same. The threats and calls to action by those who opposed the landing of the tea could not be taken lightly by those who would be calling themselves loyalists in just a few years. As we can see from this letter written by the sister of the Customs Commissioner of Boston, Anne Hulton, dated the 25th of November, 1773. The ships laden with tea from the East India House are hourly expected. The people will not suffer it to be landed at Boston. They demand the consignees to send it back. Mr. Clark resolutely refuses to comply, will submit to no other terms than to put it into warehouse till they can hear from England. They threaten to tear him to pieces if it is landed. He says he will be torn to pieces before he will desert the trust reposed in him by the consignees. His son, who has just arrived from England, he was at Liverpool last summer, and all the family were got together the first night, rejoicing at his arrival, when the mob surrounded the house, attacked it with stones and clubs, did great damage to the house and furniture. When young Clark spoke to them, and told them if they did not desist, he should certainly fire a gun at them, which he did, and wounded a man, it supposed, for they retreated carrying off a man, 
but they threatened to destroy every person in the house if anyone of their associates was killed, and a great number of stones, each so large as to have killed any person they had hit, were thrown about the table where the family were at supper. But Providence directed them so that they did not fall on any person. All the avenues to the house at the same time were guarded by armed men to prevent Mr. Clark escaping. This was beyond anything of the kind since we came here. And more shameful fates awaited teak and Siamese and local officials under the boughs of liberty trees along the northeast coast. Tarring and feathering was one of the more dramatic ways of intimidating them, as the customs official of Falmouth, John Malcolm, found out in 1773 when he was feathered over his clothes for seizing an unregistered ship. Then he had the unlucky distinction of being feathered again in 1774. The Whig, James Hawks left an account of it, which will help us understand the details of this curious appellation. They then took him to the place where the massacre was committed, and there flogged him with thirty-nine stripes, after which they besmeared him thoroughly with tar and feathers. They then whipped him through the town till they arrived at the gallows on the neck, where they gave him thirty-nine stripes more, and then after putting one end of a rope around his neck, and throwing the other end over the gallows, told him to remember that he had come within one of being hanged. They then took him back to the house from whence they had taken him, and discharged him from their custody. The severity of the flogging they had given him, together with the cold coat of tar which they had invested him, had such a benumbing effect on his health that it required considerable effort to restore his usual circulation. During the process of the chastisement, the deleterious effect of the frost, it being a cold season, generated a morbid affection upon the prominent parts of his face, especially upon his chin, which caused a separation and peeling off of some fragments of loose skin and flesh, which, with a portion of the tar and feathers which adhered to him, he presented in a box and soon after carried with him to England as testimonials of the sufferings in the cause of his country. On his arrival in England, soon after this catastrophe, Malcolm obtained an annual pension of fifty pounds, but lived only two years after to enjoy it. Men who purchase tea being described as traitors to their country. Tea a worse import than plague and pestilence. Someone literally wrote the words, the machinations of the enemies of our country to enslave us by means of East India tea. For heaven's sake, you would assume this kind of language to be used by the Chinese about the opium wars or, or alcohol among Native American communities or some such. This is tea we're talking about. The worst thing about tea is, I guess, a, a caffeine content of some kind. But again, while it all seems so totally ridiculous to the modern listener, to the modern sensibility, the tea is just the catalyst of a much deeper-rooted ideological struggle. And so extreme were these political differences that they even led to regular acts of violence and even sometimes terror taking place in the streets of Boston, such as the torture of men like John Malcolm. Looking at all of the details surrounding it, you can begin to see that the Boston Tea Party was about so much more than just spilling some tea. But hold on there, you may be thinking. What if you want to start a revolution and tear down some crowns of your own? Well, tea isn't anywhere near so important in American life today as it was back in colonial times, so what are you supposed to do? Well, now, uh, as a loyal supporter of His Majesty King George III, I probably shouldn't tell you this, uh, but also I want to make some money, so what the heck. A uh, common sense coffee roasted for visionaries! Although I suppose you could order some too if you'd like. Uh, each one of their single origin coffees, I have no idea what that actually means, is a small batch roast, I have no idea what that does, meaning that there is less burning, I didn't even know that you could actually burn coffee, and a fresher cup of 
coffee. And they even sell some admittedly quite nice looking merchandise, even if I would rather have, say, plain truth than common sense. You know how it goes. Uh, now, I don't drink coffee, but all of these people do, and they say it's delicious. Uh, honestly, I just like the aesthetic of it all. Plus, again, I stand to gain financially from this doing, doing this little bit here. Uh, uh, so visit Common Sense Coffee today using the link in the description, and not only will you get yourself a free uh, shipping on all US orders, uh, but if you use my code, Brandon F, big shocker there, uh, you will uh, also get 10% off of your treasonously delicious uh, single origin small batch roasted hot morning cup of coffee. Uh, let's discuss the details of the event itself, which as well, I think, demonstrate very strongly to us, just as it demonstrated to the British Parliament, uh, just how significant these ideological differences were. In November of 1773, a ship arrives in Boston Harbor called the Dartmouth, and she is laden with East India Company tea. She is merely the beginning of the invasion. Two more ships, the Eleanor and the Beaver, are already well on the way. Now Samuel Adams, an already iconic and infamous Bostonian, calls an emergency town hall style meeting that the people might determine what is to be done at this new and rising threat. Thousands flock to the meeting where it is determined that above all else, the tea must not be allowed on shore. They even go so far as to post guards at the city docks to prevent such from happening. Now, this standoff cannot last forever. Governor Hutchinson, you see, has drawn a line in the sand. He has ordered that the ship must not leave the harbor until the tea has been offload uh, offloaded and the duty has been paid. Now remember, this isn't just about tea. If Governor Hutchinson and the colonial government give in again, it will do nothing but further erode what limited control they might have over the situation. The, this uh, latest row is not isolated, nor is it only political or economic. The city of Boston itself has been slipping further and further into chaos for years. Now, British law states that the ships like the Dartmouth have just under a month to either offload their cargo or to sail away. Otherwise, their cargo will be seized by the authorities, you know, for taking up space and whatnot, I'm sure. Uh, Governor Hutchinson refuses to let the ship sail away, and Samuel Adams' armed guards refuse to let it be unloaded. The deadline ends on December 16th. Now, this impasse continues without any deals being reached, and new tea ships are arriving in Boston Harbor on a regular basis. Eventually, that day comes, and there the Dartmouth still sits in harbor. Samuel Adams calls another emergency meeting at the Old South Meeting House, and somewhere between five and 7,000 people are in attendance of that meeting. Now, that number may not sound all that crazy to the modern ear, but in the 18th century, the population of Boston itself, the entire city, was roughly between 15 and 20,000 inhabitants. This, uh, th this meeting represents between a third and just under one half of the total Bostonian population. Five to 7,000 people uh, may not sound like a particularly earth-shattering number these days, but if the same proportion of Bostonians came out to protest something today, according to the 2019 population estimate, it would be over 200,000 people, even up to 250,000, depending on how you want to play the statistics between a third and 50%. That's about the size of the protests in Belarus uh, last month, or the March for Our Lives protest in 2018. The kinds of movements that, for better or worse, are capable of shaking nations and the world. Now, when at the meeting, Adams receives word that the governor is refusing to back down and send the, uh, and send the tea ships away, uh, he supposedly declared to the masses there, this meeting can do nothing further to save the country. And that is the social context, the political inspiration under which later that night, somewhere between 30 and 130 individuals, including members of the so-called Sons of Liberty, took matters into their own hands. 
they boarded the tea ships and destroyed some 46 tons of tea, valued then at nearly 10,000 pounds, roughly equivalent today to $1.7 million. Now, that was the so-fabled Boston Tea Party, which we always hear so much about as the single event. But in fact, as is oftentimes the case with political violence, it was not a singular or isolated event at all. There were numerous uh, uh, little tea parties, if you will, across not only Massachusetts, but multiple colonies over the coming months, even out to a year after the initial one, with warehouses and stores and cargo ships being broken into, vandalized, their stores destroyed. Some, uh, you know, in one instance, a ship was even burned down because of this uh, general movement moving against British tea. The Boston Tea Party was not merely a, a little bit of property damage. It represented the beginning of a new wave of violence and political demonstration across the continent, and it was all centered around Boston. And at its core, this isn't really a discussion, again, about tea or even about economic oppression. Again, the Tea Act was consumer-friendly for the most part. Uh, it was so much deeper running than all of that. It was a matter of political rights and privileges. It was a matter of sovereignty, of ideology about the uh, precise nature of the relationship between the colonies and the homeland, whether that was going to be an imperial relationship or an equal one based on commercial value and whatnot. For reform-seeking colonists and the British government alike, it was yet another sign that the government was powerless to enforce its own laws to exert its claimed sovereignty over the colonies. The Boston Tea Party, at long last, was deemed by the British state to be too great an offense, a symbolic and literal assault on British law and order, and even in their eyes at least, on the rights of Britons to their liberty and property. The Prime Minister, Lord North, put it very plainly and clearly when he addressed Parliament after the fact, saying, quote, the Americans have tarred and feathered your subjects, plundered your merchants, burnt your ships, denied all obedience to your laws and authority. Yet so clement and so long forbearing has our conduct been that it is incumbent on us now to take a different course. Whatever may be the consequences, we must risk something. If we do not, all is over. And that risk came in the form of the coercive acts, which to many in Boston were intolerable. And to enforce that punishment on the city of Boston for that final act of defiance came the military and martial law. To modern eyes, the throwing of some flavored leaves into a harbor may seem like a strange way to help start a revolution. Indeed, putting a city under martial law, military occupation, because of some tea leaves, uh, may seem even more outlandish, even for the British Empire. But when you look at the deeper ideological context for which tea was merely a spark which set off the blast, it all begins to make sense why the Boston Tea Party was such a big deal. Now, thank you all so very much for watching. Of course, most particularly to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com, for it is by virtue of your support that I am able to carry on with my work. Also, incidentally, I'm offering a lot of new benefits on Patreon, so uh, everyone should go and uh, check that all out on my website. Uh, Patron-only live streams, uh, early video releases, things like that. It's all starting next month in October. Uh, and of course, until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.